Dr. Bernice King, welcome to The Daily Show. Thank you. I am so honored to be here. Um, let me start by saying happy belated uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, I've, I've seldom seen a holiday that seems to be celebrated by as many different people in as many different ways as I have seen with MLK Day in America. And as the daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I'd love to know what you feel MLK Day should be about. Well, I try to capture it in three ways. It's a time to educate, advocate, and activate. And mm. people fall under you know, each one of those in different ways. Uh, some, t some people use this as a time to, you know, advance the teachings of Dr. King. And then some people advocate. There are many issues that are, we are faced with in, in this nation um, that people are concerned about, and they use that time to raise their voices to advocate for issues and groups of people, in fact. And then activate. How do we capture the holiday under one massive theme and focus, and it became about a day of service. So we started touting a day on, not a day off. In your lifetime, you saw your father go from, from being one of the most hated men in America to now being one of the most beloved men in America, but ironically, almost not because he's changed, but because people have changed what he stood for. Hmm. That's an interesting insight, Trevor. I never heard it put that way. Wow. Yeah, because we have an affinity for, for, for dead and deceased leaders. Uh, they're more comfortable when they're no longer with us because they are not able to, you know, influence the masses in the same way. You know, it's kind of like good and evil. When you have something that's so powerful and revolutionary like that, you know, people do want to kind of find the easy, comfortable part of it. Right. Um, and, and I agree with you that that, that has happened. Um, and, and, and that's why we have to continue to be uh, resolute in teaching the whole king. <laughs> I think there's no escaping the fact that his whole essence cannot be spoken about without speaking about your mother, Coretta Scott King. What do, you, what do you wish people knew about the work that she was doing to help fight for civil rights in America? In many ways, I think she was much more um, advanced. Um, you know, uh, than my father morally uh, and in terms of her um, insight. She gave him a lot of, you said, sounding board feedback when he would prepare his messages and, and sermons. Um, but probably one of the most important ways is when it was, uh, when he spoke out against the Vietnam War in 1967. You know, um, everybody turned against him, <laughs> literally. The black leaders of Earth, NAACP, Urban League, they all turned against him because they felt that we had made so much progress on the civil rights front from the Johnson administration that we need to kind of, you know, you know, you know, be careful right, at this point that we don't alienate. Yeah. And so um, my mom said, Martin, we could really use your moral authority and voice. I mean, look, when you say he's most hated and now one of the most loved, what I say to people is the reason all of what we know about Dr. King at the level that we know it um, and why we can't seem to <laughs> shake him is because she, she immediately went to work two wow. and a half months after with a grieving widow with four little children. She had this tremendous call to continue their work and she was very strategic in everything she did. Um, it's, it's, it's like, to me, that's why I call her the architect of the King legacy. Wow. Because she really provided a blueprint for how we must continue to remember Dr. King and his teaching. And in no uncertain terms, she was insistent that we understood those teachings. You see some of the opponents of, of voting rights using your father's words in their defense or, or using it on a day to say, I'm pro Martin Luther King Jr. And then almost, you know, ignoring um, his teachings on, on what he believed in. You're looking at a country that right now is considering getting rid of the filibuster. How do you grapple with the idea of the filibuster, where voting rights needs to go in America and the risk of not having a filibuster in a country where power goes back and forth the entire time? Yeah, you know, I've had mixed feelings about it. I mean, I've, I've tweeted out about, you know, doing away with it. But, you know, it's... 
it's a difficult thing because the filibuster is neutral as we know it. It's how it's used that makes it uh, something for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. We would not be a democracy if we did not have voting rights. And I agree with the Republicans in the sense that we should make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. But how that looks is different, Mm. you know? Um, and that's what we need to be talking more about. So it's, it's kind of hypocritical to me, um, uh, to say we shouldn't set aside this filibuster and just at this point vote on what the majority says for something that's fundamental to everybody. So you got to weigh, you know, the workaround, you know, like with, uh, Kirsten Cinema and, right. um, and, and, and Manson saying, you know, the, you know, the poisonous aspect of our democracy and we have to stop what you just said, the back and forth. I actually agree we do have to do that. But at, at the price is what we're looking at. The price of them getting back in charge and saying, okay, you did this, so we're going to do this right, now to y'all and right. run to Boston. Or the damage of millions of people being disenfranchised. That's what we're looking at. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And it, and, and it, is yeah. a, it, is a, it is a dilemma. And again, funny enough, I think that's something that your father doesn't get credited enough with is how much strategy he had to put into the movements, how strategic he had to can, be in can, thinking can, about... Can you, can, you, can you say that again? Because that's what's <laughs> missing today. Before I let you go, I wanted to talk uh, about some of the work that you've been doing recently um, in spreading some, some, some really wonderful messages. You know, many people know you, you, you have a fantastic new book out talking about love, and it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful experience. Yes, there it is. It starts with yes, me. Yes, that's it. And it's, the, it's a really wonderful story of a young girl who's going out there and changing the world in, 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 you know, in her expression of love and, and, and doing things right. whilst also you know, loving people, not just sitting back. Um, but you're also the CEO of the King Center, and you, you've done something really revolutionary and, and, and different for an organization in that you've moved a lot of your lessons and a lot of the ideas about nonviolence online. Talk me through that a little bit, if you don't mind. We found a way to kind of uh, develop an online experience that is reflective of what we do in person. So nonviolence for us is a love-centered way of thinking, uh, engaging, speaking, and acting that brings about uh, personal, cultural, and societal transformation. Daddy said, and I have a dream. It's a part that most people miss in his speech. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. He was talking about how we talk to, you know, words are powerful. In my Christian tradition, we say death and life and the power of the tongue. You can murder somebody with your tongue. So when people say I'm not violent because they don't do anything physically, it's not confined to that. We clear Mm. that up even in this, this online experience. For some reason, people think love is something like this you know, man be pan be weak kind of thing. <laughs> no, it, it, it's not. What love does is it makes sure that you are always trying to elevate the situation and even the person. So I try to participate in that part of the, the struggle. And that's what nonviolence, you know, really represents. And I think if we get to that place, we can have these hard conversations. But I like to I like to talk to people in a way where their defenses come down. I love that. I'm learning how to listen because that's a nonviolent, you know, um, uh, we, um, tool as well. Listen, as my friend John Bryan of Operation Hope would say, listen without being defensive and speak, talk without being offensive. Hmm. Thank you so much for continuing to share not just uh, your father's legacy, but your mother's as well. And, uh, you know, a story that has changed the nation forever. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Don't forget, people, Dr. King's book, It Starts With Me, is available right now. For more information on the King Center's Nonviolence 365 online classes, visit the website below.